Now we're ready for our first real learning lesson. Uh, as you can see, I'm moved over now, right? I'm going to need room to write on my virtual board a lot. And you need to treat this as an actual classroom, right? So have notes out. I'll show you how to structure your notes. You are going to pause the video whenever you would ask questions. And I'm going to keep talking to you. And if you want to get the most out of this, you are going to act like a total nutcase and talk to this video, right? So when I ask questions, answer it. That's the process that works best. Good? All right. So today's topic is claims. And this is a topic we don't have a reading for. So this video is going to be really important. Now, when I say the word claims, do not read anything high tech into it. Claims is the most generic word I can think of for any statement, any idea, whether it's written, spoken, or just imagined. So this is any expression or anything you might say or think or write about the world, about how you're feeling, all of it is claims. Anything that could be communicated in any way will be called a claim. Now, this is the most basic starting point for logic. We are going to need this. I do this lesson in all of the classes I teach because without this basic way to just handle basic communication, the basic sharing of ideas, we would get nowhere in this class, right? This is, this is a lesson that, oh my gosh, I wish society could have. It would save so much heartache and so much frustration, right? You guys, now here's the larger point. This is something you already know how to do very well. On the, in the vast majority of cases, you handle claims perfectly. It is only when three claims, types of claims come up that you freak out and forget how to be logical. When claims are about morality, religion, or politics, people forget to use their basic logic when it comes to how they handle ideas and claims. When morality, religion, or politics comes up, people are somehow encouraged to be completely irrational and learn them and they forget their most basic sense of logic. All right. So let me show you that if I start with a very mundane sort of claim that you handle this perfectly. You will be able to distinguish the different kinds of claims, judge them perfectly, and everything would be great. What's the problem? This is a class in philosophy and you're dealing with me. What does that mean? You are constantly going to be dealing with morality, religion, or politics. Some of the most important, the most dangerous, and the most brilliant things in our society. We do not want to have to only talk about mundane issues, right? This isn't a family gathering where we're going to do small talk all day. We are going to talk about controversial things, so I need you to use the same logic you use in everything else as you will when you talk about morality, religion, or politics. Now, get that key claim. I am not asking you anything new. I am just asking you to use the same logic no matter what we are talking about. Don't get frightened and start talking like the idiots in our society. Okay. So, to prove this point, let me start by talking about something incredibly mundane and non-controversial. And all you are going to do on this part is just pay attention to what's happening in your brain. And when I ask you questions, please talk to me like I'm really there. Yes, you're going to look like a nutcase. And you're going to see that your logic is great. Then what we're going to do is I'm simply going to show you what is happening in your brain when you deal with these kinds of mundane claims. And then we'll fill in our little chart and I'll show you a basic chart structure. And then the key, here's how it works when we're talking about logic. Uh, make sure that the theory, right, the structure, these basic ideas make sense. But make sure they are very clear when we turn to examples. Examples are the key test to see if these ideas make sense. The theory itself should make sense, but you need to demand complete clarity when we apply the examples, then the theory should make perfect sense. All right, so let's start with this basic idea. What is very non-controversial? Uh, my pen, right? So this is the pen I'll be writing with a little bit, right? And so let me talk about my pen. You are just going to pay attention to what's happening, right? This is just a basic Sharpie, right? Good. So here's my pen. My pen has a black cap on it. My pen writes in black. Uh, let's see, black is a good color to use because it shows up really well on a white background. In fact, teachers should primarily use black markers. Right? So usual classroom experience, 
Primarily, teachers should use black. If students have some sight issues or colorblindness issues, it's good contrast, right? On a whiteboard, it erases really well. So teachers should mess with a lot of different colors. I know they're cute, but teachers should primarily use black. And also, I just like the color black, right? I find that black and gray are colors that even I know how to match other colors with, right? And black just looks cool, right? A lot of cool people wear black, uh, so I just like black. All right, now notice, super stupid speech, right? <laughs> right now you're thinking, oh great, that's philosophy. No, just an example. But let's talk about the different sorts of claims I make. When I said this, this cap is black, this pen writes in black, think of how you analyze that claim in your head. Now, if you are participating like you should, right? You're like you're a nut and talking to your computer. Right now you should see your body language shifting. When I say, how do you process this pen is black? Of course, you are doing gesturing like this. Like, uh, what do you mean? That is the stupidest, th stupidest thing in the world. Right. This is what these claims are like. They are called truth claims, and they are very much responded to with a shrug because they are very obvious. It doesn't mean that what they're saying has to be obvious, but how we handle them is a real duh sort of question, right? It, it either is or it isn't. What's the big deal? Not a deep issue. Well, yes, it might take a little research, right? Maybe you can't see this pen, right? Maybe the picture is not very clear, but it's still, once you see it, it's either is what it, it is what it is or it isn't. Got it? Easy. That's how we deal with that kind of a claim. Fine. Now, next. Then I started saying that black is a good color to use. It has good contrast, right? I said black is a good pen marker color. Now, think of how you handled that. Think of what you did to analyze that question in your head when I said it. Now, notice, a lot of this is unconscious and instinctive, and we are trying to draw it out. That's the only difficulty to this lesson, is getting you to see what's going on in your brain. So, I said this marker is a good color. I said teachers should use black. It's best for students. Now, notice, that's a different sort of claim. It is not simply, duh, it's black. It is now a judgment of value. I'm judging the quality. And now notice, do you think I made good claims, right? Not just, are they right? But do you think that those are rational? And so you would look and say, oh, good, right? Then I said, right, so pay attention, that's a question of value. Now, then I moved and I said, I like the color black. It's easy to match with other colors. Now you should be back to your body language you used again, but for a different reason. Now the body language should be, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, I like blue. Right? Yeah, I like pink. Right? Not a big thing. So now let's go back to each of these kinds of claims, right? So let's go back to truth claims, go back to value claims, and go back to those last ones, which we'll call taste claims. Good? Okay? So to make this more articulate, so we're not just left with body language of, yeah, it's black, or, yeah, I guess black's a good color for a marker, right? And you like black, I like whatever. Now let me try to make you more articulate by inserting conflict. Because what we find is when these things are completely unconscious, we don't really know how to put word, put them into words. But if I insert conflict, then we're kind of forced to say things. All right, so let's try this. So here is my marker, right? Here is my whiteboard, right? I'll have a better one. And let me show you. This marker is black. It writes in black. Good? Now, it's actually a trick pen. It actually, if you can see it, writes in orange. See it? Right? I tricked you. So what do you do? I said this marker writes in orange. I said I tricked you. How do you handle that claim? Well, see, now you're going to be forced to use words and not just shrug. It's not just duh, because there's a conflict. And so what would you say now? You would say no, right? Now, if you're an American, you would do what Trump does and attack the person that you disagree with. You would say, you're an idiot. Right? No, that's not how we handle truth claims. We talk about the claim, right? So don't attack me and say I'm stupid. Just correct me, right? Show that the claim is wrong. So if I say this marker writes in orange, you would simply say, oh, no, it doesn't. Look at the claim. That is not the color orange. That's the color black. 
That's how we do with truth claims. We deal with them very easily. Then I said this. Then I said, right, black is the best color to use. Good? All right. Well, let me go to a different pen. Good. And now, let's see what you think. I said black is a good color. Well, I think, now I'm going to switch persons. Well, I think Jeff is too busy telling all, all of us teachers what to do. I think teachers can use whatever color they want. If they want to use a different color, that's up to them. For example, I, in my classes, I prefer to use white. I think white is a perfectly good color. What do you think? No. You would say, no. Okay, we might not, we might think Jeff is being too bossy telling teachers to use black. But we can see when it comes to a value, right? White is not a good color to use. Why? Because you can't see it. If you use white pens on white paper or a white board in a classroom, no one's going to see it. Now notice, we don't simply say, that's false. We say, that's not logical. That's not rational. That's not a reasonable value. Because teachers are supposed to communicate when they write. What's the point of writing if you can't see it? So no, Jeff is at least a little smarter than this next person in preferring black. Black is a better color to use on a white piece of paper than white is if you're trying to communicate. See how we judge values. It requires some criteria. Well, what is the value for? If it's for communicating, then black is a lot better than white. Now notice we're using words like better. Good? Judgments of quality, value claims. All right, now lastly, I said I just like the color black. Now, what happens if someone disagrees and says, oh, black is so overdone, right? Everyone wears black. Pink is awesome. Now, what will we do now when we have a conflict in, ta conflict in taste claims? Nothing. Taste claims are based on personal preference, and so now we can literally, our conflict shouldn't go very far at all. Now, we could still have a good conversation, right? We don't have to get mad at each other for disagreeing because these are just based on how we see things, our own interpretations and perceptions. Good? So, if someone says, I like black, and someone else says, I don't like black, I like pink, shouldn't go very far, right? Oh, why do you like pink? Oh, I like it because it's pretty, and it's vibrant, and it's different, and more rare. Right? Oh, okay, great. I like black because I can match things with it. I'm not very good at understanding color easy. All right, so now we're ready for the theory. So, in order to help you make notes, sometimes when I'm teaching, I will say, okay, organize your notes in this way. I don't have a huge amount of space to cover a board, right? So I'm going to have to work in portions. But this, let me show you, this is the chart we're going to create. So when I am covering a certain heading, right, notice you'll be at a certain place on your notes, right? Because sometimes I'm going to want you to do something different, draw pictures, make a chart or something. So we're going to make a series of tables this time. Forgive my terrible writing, right? I'll type things when we do it officially. But I need you to create this chart to take notes in. You're going to take a lot of notes in these boxes, right? Not too many over here, right? But you're going to take a lot of notes over here, so leave plenty of room. Good? So see what you have. So we have a column here called claims, right? And then we're going to talk about the three kinds of claims. Truth claims, value claims, taste claims. And we're going to talk about them in two levels, right? So pause the video and set up this chart, right? This is how we will be taking notes. And I will talk about one column at a time as I use my virtual board here. Good? All right. So first, again, when we are talking about claims, I do not mean anything high tech. I mean any expression, right? any communication, even if it's just thought in your head, everything is a claim. Any expression, any communication is a claim. All right. So what we want to do, and again, this is what you instinctively do. I am just showing you what's happening in your head so that when we deal with controversial things, you will use the same logic and pay attention to what you're doing. So, when we are faced with a claim, we go through a two-step process. We do this instinctively, mostly unconsciously, and what is the two steps, right? So here on the left side of your chart are the two steps, right? The first thing our brain does is determine what kind of, what kind of claim we are dealing with. So we read, hear, or think a claim, and our brain just automatically, right away, judges what kind of claim it is. So we determine the type of claim. We determine if it's a truth claim, a value claim, or a taste claim. 
And that's all there are. There are only three distinct kinds of claims, and they have three distinct ways of dealing with them, right? So we'll do step one for each of our types of claims. Then we'll look at step two. This is, again, this is immediate. We do it right away, right? We figure out what kind of claim it is. And then step two, we judge the claim according to its specific criteria. If we're dealing with a truth claim, we judge it with different criteria than with a value claim or a taste claim. We'll see, taste will be really easy. So, first thing we will do now is look at truth claims. We will do the theory, and then remember, it is when we get to the examples that you want to make sure you're understanding things clearly, right? So notice, I'll label things the same, right? So first, determine what kind of claim it is. How does our brain do that? Second, judge the claim according to its specific criteria. So, truth claims. Now, notice when I call them that. These are claims of truth. It doesn't mean they are true, so we can distinguish in the way we speak from making a truth claim to saying something that's true. So you can make a claim about the truth and be false, right? It is still a claim to truth. It is a truth claim, and then we ask whether it's true or false. All right, so step one. How do we know, how does our brain figure out when we're dealing with the truth claim? Well, the first criteria, right, we'll call this 1A. This is the one that does the bulk of the work, but I'm going to say it in three different ways just to make it really clear, even though it's redundant. So, when we hear a claim like, this pen writes in black, how do we know that this is a truth claim? It's easy. When you're faced with the truth claim, the claim has to be, notice the strong language there, like underline that, right? The claim has to be true or false. There's no gray area when it comes to whether a truth claim is true or false. It has to be one or the other. What does this mean? Let me say it in a bunch of different ways. This means that two people who disagree cannot both be right. If I say this marker is black and you say it's another color, we can't both be right. We could both be wrong, right? Your guess could be wrong, mine could, but we can't both be right. A truth claim has to be either true or false. There is no in-between. It can't be both true and false at the same time. It is one or the other. Now, every once in a while, someone might get a little confusion, so I'll add a second criteria that our brain sometimes uses. This is more philosophical, right? But you'll see that it's pretty clear. So we'll call this 1B. How do you determine if you're faced with a truth claim? Second criteria we could use, and they'll lead to the same answer, it's just to be helpful, is when you're dealing with a truth claim, we can imagine, keyword there, imagine, doesn't mean we can always do it, but we can imagine it. We can imagine evidence that it would settle the issue once and for all. Meaning, if two people disagree about a truth claim, we can imagine evidence that would show who is right and who is wrong. So if we make a claim about a marker and we say this marker is black, right, we can imagine evidence that would settle the actual color of the marker. Doesn't mean we can always do it, right? Let's say my marker, let's say we can't get the pen cap off. Well, this thing is either black or it's not, right? We can imagine evidence that would settle it, even if we can't get that evidence right now, right? Let's think, maybe you think you're being tricked by the lighting. This is actually dark blue, but you can come into my office right now and determine it, but it is either black or not, right? We could imagine evidence that would settle it once and for all. Okay, so now the next step, right? The next step in the theory is how do we judge truth claims? What does our brain do when it tries to judge the worth of a truth claim? This one gets a little weird because it should be so easy, but our society is getting so weird. I think the issue is, is we don't want to cause conflict. I mean, that seems weird because Americans are constantly in conflict, right? But we're trying to avoid conflict, so we're getting to be afraid to even judge true or false anymore. So weird, right? Especially morality, religion, or politics. What do we do? We do the stupidest thing ever, and we treat these claims as if they're tastes. As if they don't matter, you believe whatever you want. No, right? Claims are true or false. You don't have to be mean to people just because you disagree. You deal with them as facts. You deal with them as truths. All right, so here we go. So when I say this marker has a black cap, right? You would shrug and say, yep, that's true. Look, I can see it. But what makes it true? Now, this is a case where because our society is so just nuts, I have to get out of the way. I have to spend some time talking about 
three misconceptions before we'll give the actual answer. The actual answer is pretty obvious, but people are so confused by this that I first have to talk about some misconceptions. Now, please be clear in your notes, these are mistakes. These are not conceptions of true or false. These are mistakes people make, but because they're made so often, I have to talk about them. Our semester will be so silly if you have these misconceptions. Don't feel bad. Many people have these misconceptions. All right, so when I say this marker has a black cap, it really does. But why is that true? A truth claim has to be true or false, so now we judge if it's true or false. And in this case, it is true. Hopefully you can see that, right? It is true. Why? The first misconception is it is proof that makes it true. This is a very smart misconception. So this is not one I will rail on and say that this is moronic. It is just a slight misunderstanding, right? Let's talk through this. When I say this marker has a black cap, that's true. But it is not true because you have proof. It would be true even if you didn't have proof. Let me explain. Let's say that I have another marker in my pocket here, right? I have a marker in my pocket. It is also black, but I won't show it to you. Now, I leave it in my pocket. I won't get it out. That marker is either black or it's not. Now, let's say that it is. Well, we don't have proof, but that doesn't mean everybody's right until we find out. No, that marker is either black or it's not, regardless of whether we have the proof. Let's make this clear by using a little demonstration, right? So first misconception is that truth is based on proof, right? We'll see the misconception if I use this basic story. Okay? So let's pretend that you have a teenage son. I have a teenage son, right? What does it mean to be a teenage boy? It means you have a lot of ambitions about what you want to do with your life, but you don't like to take any steps to get there. Good? All right, so let's test your parenting. Let's get you ready for having a teenage son. <laughs> Who am I kidding? This is New Mexico. You all have teenage sons by now, right? They're probably your same age. Just kidding. Sorry, sorry. So for a little while, my son was really interested in traveling and geography and languages, right? And so we would come over to my map in my office and we would do these little map games. Right? And so I would ask him to find me something, and then he would try to find it. And so this was fun while this was his interest, right? So I would say something like this. All right, son, find for me on the map East Timor, right? Tricky one, right? Where is East Timor on the map? And find me its capital city, got it? And then let's talk about what language they speak there. Oh, interesting, got it? Now, how does that go? As with most people, he would never find East Timor right? It's a very tragic country because of the way we in Indonesia treated it, but most people couldn't find it on a map. All right, so now I'm a good teacher, a good dad. I let that go. I don't ridicule anything like, yep, that was a super tough one. I am so sorry. All right, so now let's try a different one. All right, let's see. Son, find for me um, Argentina and find for me its capital. Good. All right, so now he goes back to the map and he's looking for Argentina. Not going so well, right? Now he's over near East Timor, which is lucky, but probably still doesn't see it. Now he's up in Russia, up in China. And here is where is a test of your parenting and your ability to be a teacher, right? He says, oh, I can't find it. I've heard of it, but your map is weird. How did you respond? But he says the map is weird. Yeah, I just kept it going. I didn't smile. I just was encouraging. Yes, that's fine. Don't worry. Go ahead. This map is weird. It's accurate. That's what's weird. Right, Americans. All right, let's start something a lot more basic, right? This shouldn't be too hard. Find for me the United States. And then find for me New Mexico. Tell me what its capital is. And we'll talk about what languages they speak there. Go ahead. All right. So now he goes to the map and what does he find? Wow, he's back in China, he's in Russia, he's now wandered over a little bit and he found Argentina. That's great, congratulations, there's Argentina, but nope, right, can't seem to find New Mexico. All right, so time's up. All right, son, what is the capital of New Mexico? And he says, so now notice, he says, oh, that's easy, it's Tarantula. Now, are you good parents? 
did you cringe or laugh with that guess? Yeah, I'm a good parent, so I just took that in. I just said, okay, tarantula, right? Let's see if that's accurate. Now, I asked, if the capital is tarantula, then prove it, right? Remember, we're dealing with that misconception. Is it proof that makes something true? So I say, all right, you have one minute to prove it. He goes back to the map. What has he found now? Now he found East Timor. This is fascinating. Completely wrong area of the world, but he found it. Good? All right, Micah, is the capital of, of New Mexico Tarantula? He says, well, I can't prove it, but that's what it is. Are you sure? Last answer. Yes, of course. That's only, oh, wait, he says. He says, no, it sounds like Tarantula. It's Santa Fe, right? Yeah, it's not Tarantula. It's Santa Fe. All right, prove it. He can't, right? Now, he says that the capital of New Mexico is Santa Fe. Does he have proof? No. Because he doesn't have proof, does that make him wrong? No. Because it's not the proof that makes something right, it's reality. What makes something true or false? If the claim accurately depicts reality, it's true, even if you don't have proof. There are plenty of things we don't have proof for, right? But they are still either true or false. Notice, proof is a smart mistake because proof is how we try to determine if a claim is true or false. Proof is how we judge reality, but it's not the proof that makes it right or wrong. Think of something else, right? Think of a claim that a lot of you people, when you weren't listening to philosophers as usual, you get things wrong. One of the things you got wrong that the philosophers knew, the philosophers knew this for over 2,000 years while well, you guys were being stupid. We knew that the sun was the center of the solar system, but you thought the earth was. Now, let's talk about proof here. You, this is what, a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, you thought the earth is the center of the solar system. Now, did you have proof? Yes, you did. And your proof was mistaken, but it was pretty logical. What did you do? Now, let's talk about different times of day. Let's pretend that it is that romantic time of the day, the last days of sunlight, you're walking out on the mesa, you have big romantic plans, you're gonna try to increase the teen pregnancy rate in New Mexico, so you head out at this time of day. What do we call those last moments of daylight, right? Beautiful orange sky, what do we call it? Sunset. What do you call it the next morning when you're doing the walk of shame, you're still not sure if you've increased the teen pregnancy rate, right? What do you call the first daylight in the morning? We call it what? Sunrise. Now notice, does it look like the sun is setting? Does it look like the sun is rising? Yes, that seems to be proof that the sun moves and the earth stands still. But the proof was mistaken. We were misperceiving it because it's actually the earth turning, not the sun moving. The sun is still in reference to us. But notice, we had proof. Proof was mistaken. How do we actually judge truth claims? Not by proof, but proof is a good way to look. It is by reality. A truth claim is true or false by, based on whether it agrees with reality or not. If it agrees with reality, it's true. If it disagrees with reality, it's false. Very easy. Second misconception, and this one is really common as well. It's the idea that if you make a claim about the facts, if you make a truth claim, it's true if others agree with you. Oh gosh, this is so scary, right? Maybe we even go so far, because you want to sound smart, maybe you can go so far as to say, as long as experts agree, or scientists agree, or doctors agree. No, right? Now, that might be good sometimes, but it doesn't make it true. Just because everyone agrees to something doesn't make it true, reality does, right? Let's time travel again. Let's go back 200 years. Let's go to the middle of America, just about anywhere in the United States 200 years ago. Just 200 years ago. And try this claim. Let's say some teacher gets up in front of the room, and they did at this time, and says, well, black people are clearly intellectually inferior to white people. <laughs> so hard to say that. <laughs> Good. Now, is this true? No, of course it's not. But... Did many, many people agree? Were there even scientists saying this? Did the bulk of the population agree to it? Depending on where you are, yes, they did. 
That is the best evidence imaginable for you can't use others' agreement to determine if something is true. I don't care how many people agree with you, your claim is not true unless it accurately depicts reality. Were tons of people wrong about that one? Yes, they were. Did they also think that women were intellectually inferior? Yes, they did. They were all wrong. We do not use others' agreement, especially the internet. You do not deserve the internet. You will find tons of people that agree with you on the internet about things you're completely wrong about. Don't use others' agreement to determine whether something is true. Last one. This one is, I'm going to have a hard time not convulsing and vomiting just talking about this one. The third misconception, don't you dare do this in my class. It is very popular right now to hear someone say, something is true because I believe it. This is the idea that truth is personal, right? You did your opinion papers already. A bunch of you said this in your opinion papers. Something is true because I believe it. Truth is a personal issue. Oh my gosh, that is terrifying. If you think your belief changes reality, I have a very tight-fitting white jacket and a van to take you to a special hospital because you are insane. If you think your beliefs dictate reality, you're a nutcase. Okay? So let's try this. Let me try to sound like, like this conception. Right? It is a personal belief of mine. It was part of my culture. It's part of my religion. I was raised by my family to believe. And it will hurt my feelings if you disagree because it is my personal truth. It's true to me that I am the point guard for the Boston Celtics. <laughs> no, that's stupid. I am not the point guard for the Boston Celtics. No matter if my culture teaches me that, my religion does, no matter how much I believe it personally, I'm nuts if I think that's true, right? Personal belief does not make something true. If you personally believe something, that just means you think it's true. It doesn't make it true at all. Reality makes something true or false. All right, so now we have our judgment. How do we judge truth claims? By whether they agree with reality. If they agree with reality, they are true. So, examples. Let's deal with these, see if you can handle them. First, we'll do both We'll do both of the steps. We will determine what kind of claim each of these claims is, and then we'll judge the claim. Okay, so claim one, first claim, right? Now, what I will do, and I will often do this, this is how I teach in the classrooms, is I will put myself in a little imaginary box when I'm giving examples. So, I will, when I'm standing in this box, I'll make a gesture like this, I will say something like, okay, I'm in my imaginary box. This is when I am not being me, right? So I am not being myself. So I can make outlandish claims, offensive claims, stupid claims. And you will know that, okay, he's giving an example. He's in his little special box. All right. So when I jump into that little box, I will give an example. And that's where I will give examples from. So you don't, right? This has happened in the past. People thought I actually was saying these things. No, these things over here might be incredibly stupid, incredibly immoral, right? They're examples. So we will attack that person if they're being an idiot. All right. First example. This one's mundane. No big deal, right? The claim. It's raining. Good. So this person claims that it's raining. So let's talk about their claim. What kind of a claim it is, right? So first step, determine what kind of claim it is. They say it's raining. Is that a truth claim? Well, let's test it. If someone says it's raining, does that have to be true or false? Can two people disagree and both be right? Can we imagine evidence that would settle it once and for all if there's a disagreement? Absolutely. Wait, wait. Some of you are getting deep there. Some of you want to go deep into the like semantics of it and say, but where? Maybe when they say it's raining, they meant tomorrow. Maybe they meant on Hawaii. Now, of course, okay, that is an interesting question. Sometimes there could be a lack of clarity. Maybe we want to ask, well, what does it mean that it's raining? Good. Maybe you have slightly different conceptions. Now, let, let's take this seriously. Let's say it's a very well-meaning question. We're not just trying to be deep, right? Sorry, this is my deep pose. 
let's say it's a legitimate question because there is could be some unclarity. Well, of course, when someone says it's raining, they mean outside right now. Otherwise, they would phrase it differently. It will be raining at this time tomorrow. If they meant tomorrow, they would have had to say it. Otherwise, they're being unclear. If they say it's raining and they meant on Hawaii, they were being unclear if they didn't say in Hawaii right now. Now, also, could we also need to ask what they mean by rain? What well, we could ask, does drizzle count as rain? What about fog? And then they could have some definition, and they're just being clear. They're just trying to clarify what they mean so we can understand it when we come to judge it. So you might say something like this. Well, I think it's raining if water is falling from the sky with enough mass to create drops on the ground. So if it's drizzling, but it's, there are drops appearing on the ground right, that you can see, then I'll call it rain. Fog is usually not rain. It doesn't leave drops on the ground. So there's my distinction. Clear, right? We got really deep on it, right? Now we understand what they mean. So is it a truth claim? Obviously, it's a truth claim. It's either raining or it's not. Two people who disagree cannot both be right, and we could easily settle it with evidence. Well, right now, we are in different times and places. Okay? Does that change this from being a truth claim? Because it's a little harder to judge because you're not watching this right now when I'm saying it's raining. That doesn't make it no longer a truth claim, right? It means it's either raining right here outside right now or it's not truth claim. Now, how do we go about judging the claim? It's a truth claim. It's raining. Is it true or false? Well, we'd have to check, right? We don't, you don't have access to outside right now because you're not watching this live. You're watching this recorded. It is either raining or it's not. It's a truth claim. Right now, I look out my window, right? Double check. No, nope, it's not raining. The claim is false. It's a truth claim, but it's false because it's not raining outside right now. Easy. All right. Next claim. Now, I'm going to get you ready for controversial claims, right? So these examples are doing a lot of work, right? I am being very sneaky in getting you ready for controversial things. All right, so let's try this example. Oh my gosh, I am sorry. And again, I'm going to need to use my little box. Ready? All right. I'm in my little box, right? And now I am my wife, right? So I have my wife in this little box. Okay, so let's imagine the scenario. So here's me, here's my wife, good? It is bedtime, right? I suck in my stomach, try to look a little taller, try to use a voice that's a lot less annoying than my usual voice, right? And I say, wifey, love, love? Wifey says, I have a headache. Damn! Right? Good. Now, am I a good husband or do I analyze everything she says using logic? Yes, right? I'm a terrible person, so I judge everything based on logic. So let's test her claim. Her claim is, I have a headache. Good? You know why she's saying that, right? Now, let's test her claim. Is it a truth claim? Good? Think about it. Does the claim have to be true or false? Can two people disagree and both be right? Well, let's try that. She says, I have a headache. I say, no, you don't. Can we both be right? No, I'm going to be punished, right? I would have wounds if I tried that. That's just ridiculous, right? Someone can't have a headache and not have a headache at the same time. It is a truth claim. Here's the tricky part. Can we imagine evidence that would settle it? Yes, there is a truth of the fact, but why is that such a good example for getting out of love loves with someone who looks like me, right? It's brilliant because the evidence is so hard to come by, but there is evidence. She is feeling pain or she's not. Can we take her down to her neuropsychology lab, hook her up to what, an EKG or something, and prove, or an MRI, a functional MRI, right? Can we do that and prove once and for all? Yes. Will she let me take her to the neuroscience lab and prove it? No, she won't sign the consent forms. What a jerk. Good. But there is a truth of the matter. Evidence could settle this, though the evidence is really hard to come by. Now, notice earlier I said that historically people believe that blacks or women were inferior, inferior intellectually to white people like me, right? White men, right? 
Notice how genius a woman is to use that excuse for getting out of love loves with someone like me. It's brilliant because the evidence is so tricky. But does that make it no longer a truth claim? No, right? We don't say that, well, since you can't prove it, it's up to me whether it's true. No, it's not personal belief. That's stupid, right? If we all agree she has a headache, right? No, right? It's either true or false. It's just hard to find evidence for. So now, step two, judge the claim. I have a headache is a truth claim. Is it true or false? Now, here are where it gets tricky. And some of you are huge jerks and you're saying, she's lying. Look at you. Of course she's going to lie. Right? Who wants to make love to that? Shut up. Right? Here's where we have to be very un-American and very logical and instead say this. What do we say? It is a truth claim, but we don't know if it's true. We don't have enough, we don't have a clear picture of reality. We don't have her sense of what she's feeling. Because we don't know, we simply say, I don't know. That doesn't make it a taste claim. That would be stupid. That doesn't mean everybody believes whatever they want and it's all personal preference. No, she either has a headache or she doesn't. We just can't judge it. So I have to let it go. She's the expert on whether she has a headache. I can't access the evidence like she can. So I have to simply say, I'm not sure if it's true or false. I'll have to take her word for it. Damn, right? Hey, sorry. Good. That's how truth claims work. One more, one more example, right? Let's see if you're ready. Next claim in my little box, right? Doesn't mean I believe this, right? But it could. Next claim, God exists. All right, ooh, religion. Now we're dealing religion. So step one, judge what, sorry, judge step one, determine what kind of claim is this. If someone claims God exists, are they making a truth claim? See what's happening. Ooh, well, that's religion, right? Nobody knows what's true or false with religion, and everybody gets really mad about this stuff. That doesn't change the logic, right? Can two people disagree about whether something exists and both be right? No. Existence is a true or false issue. God, now notice, might we have to ask what we asked about rain. What do you mean when you say God? What sort of evidence would there be? We are simply asking them to clarify what they mean. Do you have a traditional conception of God or something else? And then when we ask them, that thing either exists or it doesn't. Two people who disagree about whether that thing, that God exists, can't both be right. They either is or it isn't. That thing can't exist and not exist at the same time, like rain. Can we imagine evidence that would settle it? Yes. But how hard is that evidence to come by? Think about it. Most traditional conceptions would say, well, we'll know when we die. Well, that's pretty hard to come by that evidence, right? I can't pop off and die and come back and tell you who's right or wrong. So there is evidence we can imagine. This is a truth claim, but it's tricky. It's still a truth claim though. Doesn't make it personal. Doesn't make it a taste claim. That's silly. So. How, did we, how would we go about now? We've determined it's a truth claim. How do we judge it? God exists. Is it true or false? That's what now notice what we're doing. We're now being logical. We would say there is a lot of disagreement, but what is it? Reality is hard to decipher on this one. We can't just look and see whether God exists. There's a lot of tricky evidence to deal with. So what do we have to be? Like with headache, the headache example should have gotten you ready for this. We have to simply say, we're not sure. If you had evidence that was absolutely clear, you could show it to people and it would settle it. But you don't have clear evidence, right? So we have to be humble. Some of you would say, I know God exists. Some of you would say, I know God doesn't exist. Some of you are in between. But the case is, reality is very hard to decipher on this one. So we have to be humble, not get pissed off, not firebomb a country because they disagree. It's not really what wars are about. They're always about wealth, poverty, wealth and property and markets. Anyway, sorry, side topic. But we can't get mad about this because we do not. We are not experts on this evidence. And in fact, let me say something a little more, right? It is harder to prove that God exists. And so the onus of proof here is not with the atheist, it's with the theist. You theists have to 
be that much more humble about this stuff because it is hard to prove that God exists. So if someone thinks they don't, they're actually being more logical. Now, I happen to think God exists, right? But I know that it is much wiser to think God doesn't because the proof is so tough, right? So please calm down and be nice, right? Be humble. You don't, you can't prove once and for all whether God exists, just like it's hard for my wife to prove she has a headache, right? Tricky, good, but still truth claims. All right, so now let's move to the second kind of claim, value claims. We will do the same two things. What does our brain do? When we hear a value claim, first we determine if it's a value claim, and then we judge the claim. Right? So how does our brain determine when we're faced with a value claim? It's fairly straightforward. Now, there could be cases that are a little tricky, and in those cases, you would look and test it by truth claims, see if it follows those criteria, and then make sure it's a value claim, right? So be a little more careful. But the basics are, you can tell you're faced with a value claim because the claim will hinge on a judgment of quality. Notice, the key to that idea is not that it's a judgment. Every claim is a judgment. If I make a truth claim, it's a judgment about reality. This is also a judgment, but it involves quality. The quality of the judgment is what's key. Now notice, if you're judging quality, that means this isn't a yes or no question. That means it's a matter of degree. So, a value claim will hinge on a judgment of quality, and how do you know this? You just look for the quality judgment terms. You look for little flag terms that connote quality. If you say something is good or bad, right or wrong, moral or immoral, when you say something should or shouldn't happen, right? Notice, should is a recommendation. Should is saying that thing is good and should be done. When we say something is beautiful or sexist or meaningful or important, we could go on and on. These are judgment of, judgments of quality. They are matters of degree. And notice, when we make a judgment of quality, think back to truth claims, we are not simply referring to a single piece of evidence that would settle it. It involves a lot more criteria of the author. Now, when I say author, I simply mean the person making the value claim. We have to talk to the author to figure out what their criteria are. Now notice, there is usually a lot of room for disagreement. Two people can disagree and both be perfectly logical. For instance, let's take a case like so-and-so is a good mother. Now notice, this is a judgment of quality. If we said so-and-so is a mother, right, that either is true or false. But when we say good mother, the hinge of that claim is the word good, and so now we're dealing with the value claim. Are there disagreements, very valid disagreements, about what makes a mother good? Sure, because there could be different criteria. Some people are very strict, some people are very sweet, caring, and forgive everything, and we would have different conceptions about what a good mother is. Now, that doesn't mean there can't be some clear cases, right? Yeah, she beat her kids to death. Bad mother, right? Clear. But there's a lot of gray areas as well, because criteria can shift. All right. How do you know when you're faced with a value claim? The claim will hinge on a quality judgment being made. Quality is the key, and we simply look for the terms that connote quality. Fairly straightforward. Second step, we judge the claim. How do we judge value claims? Here is another set of controversies because you are raised with a bunch of social psychology that said value claims can't be judged. All value claims are equal. We must be tolerant of all values. Right. I love their intention in saying that. They were trying to help you to be more tolerant, enjoy the pluralism of the world, but that's completely overstated. We can very much judge value claims. We just need to be nice and careful when we do so. Pause there for a second. I need you to sign a verbal disclaimer before I can teach farther, because many people get themselves in a heap of trouble when they try to judge value claims. So, please repeat after me. I know this is silly, right? But please, right? You need to do this, or you can't keep watching this video, legally. I am not responsible for this if you don't agree to this little disclaimer. Ready? Listen. Repeat after me. At least whisper, right? I am a sweet, innocent little grasshopper. Repeat. I am a sweet, innocent little grasshopper. And I will not judge value claims without Jeff's help yet. Do you hear me? 
right? You are agreeing to that. You will not judge these claims yet because you can get yourself into real trouble because this is tricky and subtle. How will I know when you're ready to judge value claims? How will I know when you no longer need my help? Because you will judge claims very differently. You will be more concerned with your own claims, your own culture, your own society than judging others. Someone will ask you a question. They will say, oh, do you see how terrible Iran is or how Saudi Arabia treats women? And you will say, yeah, that's intellectually interesting to talk about, I guess. But I'm much more interested in how I treat women, the inconsistencies I have, how I need to improve my values and help my society treat women better. Do you get the idea? That's when I know you're ready. I know you're ready when you think of your own values first and other people's problems second, then I know that you get the logic of this. All right, so let's try. So how do we judge value claims? Value claims require the author's criteria. So notice, here's the issue. We judge value claims by how rational the claim is. We judge it. Now, what is another way of saying rational? Another basic idea of being rational is being consistent. If you contradict yourself, you are not rational. And so, here is the phrase. We judge a value claim by how consistent it is with the author's other values and with the facts. In order to have a good value claim, an author must be consistent with their values and must be consistent with reality, with the facts. Because value claims, like a good mother, are also based on some truth claims being made. We are making a value claim about the facts. So, key criteria, you judge how consistent the value is with the author's other values and with the facts. If the value is not consistent with the author's other values and consistent with reality, then it is a bad value claim. But notice when we say this, value claims exist on a spectrum, so does the idea of consistency. It is not just you're consistent or you're not. You could be more or less consistent. So notice, if we were to make a little spectrum of how consistent a value claim is, we could have value claims that are just brilliantly perfect. And we could say, that claim you just made is consistent with all of your other values, absolutely consistent with the facts of the world. That is a really consistent claim. Or there could be slight inconsistencies, right? We might say, like, that is that does make sense. It's basically consistent. There might be some problems of consistency. You might have your facts a little off, but that still is legitimate. It still makes sense. It's basically consistent. And notice, you could also run into someone that is completely inconsistent. They are hypocrites or they contradict themselves. They have the facts wrong. Their values do not cohere together. They do not practice what they preach. We could say all sorts of things about them. Way down there, you could say that author is incredibly inconsistent. And this is where you are right to say that it's dangerous, right? That person is a moron, right? That is a terrible value claim. Notice, we can judge these sorts of things, right? We need to sometimes. All right. So let's look at our examples, right? Here's where the examples are key, because this is a pretty hard criteria, but this is what we do, right? This is what our brain already does. Now notice, if this was an ethical theory class, right, we would go much deeper into this. We would say there is more than just consistency. We can talk about issues of things like rights and care and harm and things like this. So this is just the basic logic a value claim must have before we would go on and talk about more elaborate conceptions of what makes morals right or wrong. This is just the basic logic of it. All right. So let's look at some cases so I can show you how to apply this idea. Let's start with um, an easy one, right? Let's pretend that I'm wearing a watch, right? So I'm going to occupy my little square. I'm not going to be myself, right? I'm going to be someone else, right? And let's pretend I'm wearing a watch. Now, this involves interaction because notice, in order to judge a value claim, you've got to get to know your author, right? So I'm going to jump here. Now, this person here is going to be me 20 years ago, right? So I'm wearing a watch. This is me 20 years ago. This is when I was cool. This is when I was a surfer, right? And so let's pretend I have on my surfing watch. I hate wearing jewelry and watches, right? But then I would put on a watch just for surfing so I could get to work on time and stuff, right? So pretend I'm wearing a watch. Now, Let's talk about different claims. I'm wearing a watch. What kind of a claim is that? Truth claim, right? It's either true or false. Two people can't disagree and both be right, right? But I'm going to say something else. 
This is a great watch. Pretend I'm wearing a watch. Now I said not just I'm wearing a watch, truth claim, but this is a great watch. All right, so now let's talk about our author. Our author claimed this is a great watch. Now notice what we have to do. In order to judge value claims, you can't just sit aside. You have to get to know your author so you can judge their consistency. So we have to ask our author questions, good? Now we could start with simply saying what makes it great, but notice, in a case like a watch, a very non-controversial sort of thing, we can imagine even more particular questions we would want to ask, right? So for example, and now notice, when you're asking questions about the watch, you're also revealing their values in the way they answer. So I would say something like this, right? I would say, uh, is the watch of good quality, right? Jeff, yeah, really good quality, right? Does it keep accurate time? Yes, actually, this watch kept accurate time for it was something like 15 straight years, right? I don't use it anymore, but it was perfectly accurate even to the second for something like 15 straight years and all on the same battery. Wow, seems pretty good so far. Uh, let's see, is it comfortable? Yeah, for a surfing watch, this one was fairly thin. A lot of them are big and hard to put under a wetsuit. This was thin. It was the most comfortable watch I've ever seen that had that kind of strength, right? And that kind of durability. Oh, wait, so is it durable? Yes, this was a 500 meters water resistant. You can't say waterproof with diving watches, but technically it was a diving watch, right? That means it was very durable. Uh, were the materials uh, durable? Yep, it was stainless steel, and I don't know what the glass was, but I banged this thing around a lot and had nothing happen with it. Good. What will we say about that person's claim? What will we say about 20 years ago Jeff's claim that that's a great watch? We would say, and notice, did you hear the criteria he was using, right? His criteria were very much practical criteria. He didn't talk about how it looked, he talked about how it worked. And is he right in saying that was a great watch if his criteria are keeping time and being durable? Yes, he made it obvious that those are his criteria and we would say, yes, he is being very consistent in saying that's a great watch if those are the facts. Notice, value claims will involve truth claims and so if it was true it lasted that long, if it was true it kept that perfect time, it was that durable, then he is being consistent in saying it's a great watch. All right, so now notice. Let's change authors. So we can see what happens when authors have different criteria. And this, because I am my immature self, I am going to be a dork with this one, okay? So here we go. I'm jumping into my example square. Example, this, pretend this person's wearing a watch who, as well. And now who is this person going to be? My stereotype of young college students in America. Ready? Okay, so this is not gonna to pretend to be one of you. Good, here we go. So, here's my claim. This watch is dope. <laughs> hey, sorry. Notice how I'm a huge fan of 90s hip hop. Oh my God, Gangstar, Tribe Called Quest. You guys are saying all of the terms that we said in the 90s with hip hop, right? It's so cute. You say things are fat, you say things are rad and dope. It's so funny. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so you say this watch is dope. Oh, sorry, I've got to get into character. I've got to look like I'm disinterested in things. Got to have a little gangster lean. This watch is dope, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Now let's judge their claim. What do we have to do? We have to ask questions. We have to see if the claim is consistent with their other values and consistent with the facts, right? So let's test. And yes, this will be a, just a stupid stereotype of, of these sorts of values. All right, so. I'm gonna ask questions, right? I hope you're asking questions of this person right now, right? See your own inconsistencies because you might have similar values. Uh, does the watch keep good time? Uh, I don't really use it to tell time, dude, right? This thing is just dope, right? It looks, it's fire, straight fire. <laughs> it's icy. Sorry, I will not imitate your slang. Okay, sorry. It's just dope. No, I don't use it to tell time, right? I'm always on my phone, so I always know what time it is. It's not for telling the time. Okay. Well, is it durable? No, not durable at all, right? I would never get this thing wet. That would probably ruin it, right? Now, right now, according to my values, this is not a good watch. But notice, I have to understand this author's values, understand his values. So maybe I might have to ask because 
I'm an old fogey that thinks watches are supposed to tell time. So what makes this watch dope? Well, look at it, player, right? Look at it. Super shiny, right? Really expensive. It is made by Shakata. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jay-Z has one, right? Not too many people have them. They're very rare. What makes it dope? When people see it, they go like this. Oh, damn, right? It looks really good with my kicks, matches my cell phone, makes my eyes go pop, right? <laughs> Stuff. Looks cool with all my outfits, right? That's what makes it dope. Oh, and by the way, it cost $3,000, right? <laughs> now, according to my criteria, that is stupid. But is he being consistent in his criteria? Yes. And now that I understand his criteria, what he values, I can ask him more careful questions. I can ask, what is it made of? Ah, right? It is made of platinum, diamonds, uh, titanium. What else do you guys care about? Plutonium. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Please tell me it's not made of plutonium because then you have cancer right now and that thing would weigh like 17 pounds, right? <laughs> okay, sorry, I got that wrong. Not plutonium. Titanium, platinum, diamonds, right? The brand is really well known and expensive. Uh, let's say it's $30,000. I don't know. Good. Now notice, is this author being consistent? Yes. Now we might want to say those values are pretty stupid. You're spending that much on a watch, you better have that much extra money around. Your kids better have health care, right? You better have some money saved for things that are going to happen to you. I hope you spend decent money on your education. If you could spend that much on a watch, I hope you're not in debt. We would say those things, but notice what we're, what we're doing there. We're having a different conversation about their meta ethics, right? About their overall value scheme. But based on the watch, except for the plutonium claim, right, they were being consistent. Now notice what we would say. We would say that Surfer Jeff, man, that guy was good looking, right? He had, look at it, he had great hair, right? He was in good shape. Sorry, sorry, right? Look at him. Anyway, Surfer Jeff, right, we would say consistent values in judging the watch as a timepiece. Good. Player, right? You? We would say consistent values as long as you're consistent in judging this as what? A piece of jewelry or an accessory. What are the criteria for an accessory of jewel or jewelry? Impressing other people, looking attractive, being of the right brand, displaying some sense of luxury. Some of those stuff I think will get a little ridiculous, but you would say if they're consistent with the criteria, yeah, that watch is dope, right? Now, again, we could go beyond that and say those criteria are going to get you into trouble, right? Because they are a very shallow sense of valuing things. But again, consistent. All right. Now let's try something, and this is when we start to get controversial, right? So let's try something controversial. Again, you will not do this outside of this class, right? It'll get you into trouble, right? But I'll show you how it can be done. So, new example. Not me, okay? I hate this guy. New example, right? Because oh, this is so hard, so hard to say again, right? Hitler was a great man. <laughs> okay. We are talking to this person who makes the claim that Hitler was a great man. Now, yeah. we need to ask him questions, see if he's consistent in his values, and so we could ask questions. Now, notice how some of you would immediately get heated and not be able to understand this guy very well got to stay calm. You've got to try to understand things, right? So we could say, all right, what made him great, right? Well, he was a great leader, right? Remember after the global Great Depression, he pulled the uh, Germany out of the Great Depression with his economic policies. He was a great military leader until he attacked Russia, right? Great military leader, uh, got all the people behind him, well, at least most of them, most of the people behind them. Uh, Germany after World War I was just the most shamed country on the planet. Their rights were stripped away by the agreements, the treaties, and he brought back pride in Germany. He made people feel that Germany was great again. Sorry. <laughs> he made people feel that Germany was great again, right? And was just an amazing leader. All right, right? So do you consider someone great if they kill millions of people for things that are completely out of their control? 
Kill people for their ethnicity. Kill people because they're gay. Kill people because they're socialists. Yes, you, he, we, Germany was called National Socialism, but some of the first people put in concentration camps were socialists, right? So, do you think it's right to put people in camps because they have a different ethnicity than you? We, should we kill people because they're disabled? Should we kill people because of the way they look, right? Oh, well, no, that was wrong, but he was still a great leader. Okay, so now notice what's happening. Sorry, sorry. Now notice what's happening. This person, fairly scary person, right, is trying to sneak around the criteria. Just like this shift in criteria from being a timepiece to being a piece of jewelry, this person is trying to distinguish being a great leader from being a great person. Now, do they have some consistency in saying great leader? Sure they could, right? There were some leadership qualities Hitler had that were pretty cool, but as a human being, we could never call him a great human being. You could say, had some good qualities as a leader, but that's a very careful criteria that this douchebag is using to make a very careful point that they are gonna try to argue for, but we would make a distinction. This would be like saying, so-and-so is a great lawyer. Does that always mean they're a great person? No, you could be a great lawyer, successful lawyer, and be a terrible person. And so notice we're using different criteria. As a leader, some consistencies. Attacking Russia, stupid, right? Things like this, right? Being a racist, stupid. Being a fascist at the time, right? Anyway. But we can see using different criteria. I think someone is only a great man if they're a great human being as well. Hitler was not a great human being, might have been a charismatic leader, might have done some good things economically, but terrible human being, so I would never call him a great man. But you get the idea. All right, one more, really scary, right? I have had a student misunderstand this one and complain, right? Like this was scary. This is not me, this person is awful. But let's see if we can talk to a person that's awful. Let's see if we can talk to someone that's awful and judge their claims without resulting to the normal kind of talk show yelling. All right, here is this douchebag. Try it. Please don't misquote this. Okay, this douchebag says, rape isn't always wrong. Damn, okay, good. Now, what kind of claim are all of those claims? Hitler's a great man, obviously value claim, right? It's a terrible thing to say, right? A good watch, dope watch, isn't always wrong. Notice, what kinds of claims are these? Obviously value claims, right or wrong is the hinge of the claim, being a great watch, being a dope watch, right? The quality is the key to the claim. Sorry if I wasn't clear with that. Now, let's talk about this one, right? This terrible human being says rape isn't always wrong. Now, let's ask questions, right? That seems awful to begin with, but let's see, let's be logical and judge the consistency of the author. So, let's ask a question of this douchebag, right? Are, what are cases when rape isn't wrong? Well, rape isn't wrong. Now, of course, I don't think rape is a good thing, but it is not wrong as long as you're raping a woman of an inferior social class. Whoa, okay. So now we understand the claim. Now we can ask questions and show that this person is inconsistent in both their values and in their facts. Let's try. Let's start with facts. Well, what makes someone of an inferior class? Why are they inferior? Why aren't they just unlucky, right? Does wealth give you greater value and greater rights? Well, look at how they live. They're illiterate, right? They beg for food. They have no class. They have no pride, right? We would say. But wasn't that just a matter of luck? If you were born in one of those families, wouldn't you be illiterate? Wouldn't you have to beg for food? This is nothing they can control. Someone's rights aren't based on what family they happen to be born to. It's the qualities they have. If these women were given the same opportunities you were, wouldn't they be just as literate as you, just as wealthy as you? So it's pure luck. It's nothing that they deserve. And we could get into how rights work and how this person's conception of the facts about what makes people superior and inferior is a completely inconsistent set of values. 
then we could attack their values and see if they're consistent. And we could ask a question like this and try not to have too much fun with this because they'll get really mad. It is not good to make people mad and defensive. You want to keep things cordial. Cough, cough, Trump. Talk to people. Cough, cough. Right? Politics in America. Talk about claims. Don't attack people. All right. So, right, would you be okay if someone that was wealthier or more literate than your daughters raped your daughters because they thought they were inferior? No. That would be awful. Right? Exactly. This person is not going to be consistent in the way they hold all their values. Would they consent being raped if someone smarter than them or wealthier than them came along? No. This is an inconsistent set of values, a set of values that wouldn't be held consistently. So we could say, I'm so sorry, but you have your facts wrong and your values aren't consistent, right? You wouldn't consent to be treated, be treated the way that you think these people should be treated. Let's make a really quick tangent here, right? Let's do a little quick aside into the concept of relativism, right? Briefly. Many people come in just because of the way social media is, because of the way you're educated, and you think that just it's a basic thing that morals are relative. Now, there is something smart about that, but it's taken too far with a different misconception. We can talk about ethics at two levels, actually three levels. We can talk descriptively about ethics, we can talk normatively about ethics, or we can do what's called moral theory or meta-ethics, right? Let me explain briefly, right? Uh, let's use an analogy of some rednecks at a car show, right? So let's show how th uh, two rednecks can be at a car show and talk about the cars descriptively, normatively, and at the level of meta or theory, okay? So really quick. So let's say these two rednecks are talking at a car show and they say something like, right, that Ford over there has XXX horsepower. Now notice, they can make descriptive claims about the cars, level of description. That car has that much horsepower. That car is red. That car has a maximum speed of that many miles per hour. Now notice what they're doing. They are making truth claims about the cars, right? They are judging the facts of the cars. There could be a disagreement, and they would have to check the evidence to see who's right if they can do it, right? Good. Then they can make normative claims about the cars, right? They could say, ooh, that Ford is the best muscle car at this car show. Notice what they said, the best, right? Now notice, is the best something that you could just find evidence for? Can two people disagree and both be right? Yes, because it's going to depend on the criteria, right? They might disagree. They might say, that Mustang is the best car. No, actually, that Camaro is the best car. And they could disagree about what is the best. Now, what do you do with those disagreements? You go to the level of theory at that point. You go from describing cars to judging the values of cars, to going to the level of theory. This is where the real philosophy would come in. And now we could imagine these two rednecks getting in an argument and then being smart enough to talk about the theory, right? Here we go. I think that car's best. Well, I think that car's best, right? Why, right? So, forgive the redneck names, Baba, why do you think that Ford is better than that Ford? And you would say, right, theory, well, I judge the quality of a car based on purely power. I'm looking at torque and horsepower and things like this. And so then we would look and say, oh, well, you're being consistent with your facts and values because, yes, that Ford there has the most torque and horsepower. Well, why do you disagree then? Theory. Well, and now let's name him Gus, right? Well, Gus would say, well, I think that car is better because... I judge cars based on their engineering and efficiency. So I'm looking for things like heat loss. I'm looking for things like fuel efficiency. And so you see why I think that car is better. Oh, I do get it. You are being consistent with your values and your facts when you claim that car is a better engineered car in its efficiency. Do you get it? Now they can deal with their disagreement and understand each other. All right. So this is the problem that is happening when it comes to relativism. There are two, let's just start at the first two ideas. There is descriptive relativism and there's normative relativism. At the descriptive level of relativism, all you are doing is 
talking about or describing the facts of different values, right? You could say that country in Northern Africa practices a forced female genital mutilation, right? Now, either they do or they don't. You haven't said they're right or wrong. You say they do that. They practice that, good? You haven't made a value claim yet. And then you could say that is a wrong thing to force women to undergo, obviously. And you could show that, and you could show that you're consistent with your values in saying that that's wrong to force women to go through that. You know, do you get the idea? Different levels. So, we can descriptively say, let's go to the relativism point. Do different cultures, different institutions, different subcultures have different ethical values? Yes, they do. Doesn't take a lot of sociology textbooks or anthropology books to say we do find different values in different places. That's simply describing them. Notice, the mistake is made when we go from describing them to making value claims about those differences, right? Looking at the world and seeing that there are different values relative to class and place and saying the next thing, which is normative. Listen to the difference. To make a claim about normative relativism isn't just saying there are differences. It's to say these differences are right. Good? So listen to these claims. It would say all values are equal. We should be tolerant of all moral values. Notice how different that is. To say that they're all good or should all be tolerated is now making a normative claim. Should all cultural values be tolerated? No, not if you're a Nazi who is killing people just because they're Jewish. We shouldn't tolerate that. That is not a good norm. Now, descriptively, did Nazis have different values than I do? Yes, descriptively, these values are relative. But does that mean the Nazis should be tolerated? No, right? Do you get the difference? Now, let's go a little farther with this. Take an idea, so now let me critique this idea of normative relativism that some of you think is a good way to go about this. Now again, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to appreciate the pluralism in the world, try not to be dogmatic, try not to be a jingoistic jerk, right? I showed you how tricky this could be. You're not going to do this outside of the class. Now notice the problems. Let's take a basic one. We should be tolerant of all cultural values. Now notice, that is a should claim. Now, what if I am in a culture that isn't tolerant? What are you doing? You're judging me. You're saying I should be tolerant when I'm not. Notice, it's kind of contradicting itself. To say that we should be tolerant of all cultural values is actually intolerant. I agree that we should be tolerant of cultural values that do not lead to harms or radical moral inconsistencies. But notice, that's a value claim. Let's try it a different way. Let me show you that you, in fact, are not this kind of relativist at all. You just think you are. Right now, in your brain, and actually make little notes on your paper, think of some morally great human beings in history. Who are some of the greatest human beings in, mor in the moral sense, right? Think of famous ones that people have heard of. What are people that were genuinely great in history? Think of some. Write them down. What did you come up with? Let's see. Uh... Jesus, Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, maybe a few others. Oh, <laughs> so sad. that's all you have. But let's talk about them. Were any of these people, any of these heroes, and they were great, right? And you should talk about each of them and study them, right? Read their works and their speeches. Were any of these people normative relativists? No. Every single one of them knew when it's time to not tolerate cultural values. Uh, take Jesus. What does he do? Goes to the Pharisees and Sadducees and says, the rules you are putting on top of the law are wrong. Right? Notice, Jesus was judging people's values at all three levels. The legal values, right, at the time. The moral values and the religious values. He said, these are all wrong. MLK Jr. goes to the South and says this inequality of treatment is wrong, even though Christianity was justifying the treatment of blacks in the United States, even though the laws were justifying this, and of course the culture and the morals were racist, so they were justifying it, right? Gandhi, right? What does he do? 
says these religious, moral, and legal practices of separating into the caste system are wrong. We need to overthrow this caste system. He judged the values at every level. You are not relativist like you think you are. There is descriptive relativism, but normative relativism is, a incon is an inconsistent value. Good? All values are not equal. We don't have to tolerate all values. Don't get me wrong. Most values should be tolerated. And especially because until you're good at judging these, you might be judging from your values and your values might suck. Those other people you're judging might have better values when you get good at judging consistency. So be nice, right? Watch yourself. All right. The last category is very easy because I am going to completely cheat, right? And it's rightful. When we go to judge taste claims, now notice, what are taste claims? Taste claims are simply personal statements of preference. I like this kind of pizza. This is my favorite color. Good? Fine. Now, for the most part, we just judge taste by whether the author makes sense, whether they are credible in their judgment. If someone says that is the best pizza, but they've never tried it, well, it's pretty hard to say they're credible in their taste. But here is the cheat, right? We are going to treat tastes as values. There might be some discussion about who makes the best burrito in Albuquerque or something, but even that kind of a claim we are going to treat it as a value claim. We are going to see if the author is being consistent. We're going to talk about the facts of the burrito and see if they're being consistent. So we are not going to talk about taste in here, right? I'm not very interested in taste unless they're value claims. Unless when you say that that's a good watch, I'm going to judge it as a value claim, just not as just a personal preference. When you say you like the color pink, I'm going to ask you if you're consistent. Do your criteria make sense, right? Sure. You can have some taste claims outside of this class, but we are going to judge them all as value claims. We are going to see if they're consistent in their quality and consistent with their facts.